Okay, hello again. Here's the representative list of stars for the show today. During the first half of the lecture, we'll spend most of our time on the career of Jan Vermeer, now regarded as the greatest genre painter in history and one of the greatest painters in any category in all of European art. Of all painters, he's probably the one whose stock has risen the most since his lifetime. After the break, we'll hear about something very different, the Thirty Years' War, certainly one of the most destructive wars in European history, and which Thomas Carlyle calls the most intricate of modern occurrences. In this connection, we'll hear about the Emperor Ferdinand II and his great General Wallenstein, and then about Philip IV of Spain and his friend and painter Velasquez, whom I would regard as the greatest Spanish painter ever. We'll also hear quite a bit of music, of course, including what is now, without doubt, the most famous piece of music written in the whole 17th century. Town Hall in Delft now, built by Hendrik de Keyser, who built the Westerkirk in Amsterdam, where Rembrandt is buried, and who also sculpted the tomb of William the Silent in the new church at the opposite end of the marked or main square here in Delft. You should remember that Delft was the de facto capital of the United Provinces as the residence of William the Silent until his assassination back in 1584. I mentioned last time that I thought that Harlem was probably the city most entitled to be called the Florence of Holland as far as painting is concerned, and I think Delft might rank second. Jan Steen and Peter de Hoek both spent a large part of their lives here, and Jan Vermeer, now considered second only to Rembrandt himself in the history of Dutch art, and second to no one in his chosen specialty, genre painting, was born in Delft and spent his whole life here. Short life. This is the new church, as it's called, at the end of the square opposite the town hall. It's essentially a building of the 15th century, but the upper spire with the clock is 19th century. Vermeer was born and spent his early career in a building that stood to the left, the north of the square, and spent the later part of his life in a house on the south side, and he may never have been beyond walking distance from this church in his whole life. Another important resident of Delft was Hugo Grotius, who was, like the poet Vondel we heard about last time, an Arminian, that is, someone who favored a policy of religious toleration and accommodation with the Spanish Netherlands. Jan van Oldenbarnveldt, the founder of the Dutch East India Company and a prominent Arminian, was executed by the agents of the stadtholder Maurice. William's son, William the Silent Son, in 1619 for pushing his views too aggressively, and Grotius himself was sentenced to life in prison at that time, but he escaped. His wife was given permission to bring him a trunkload of books, and after the books were unloaded, he got in and was carried out. <laughs> This is the modern statue which honors him in the square here. He spent the rest of his life in exile, mostly in France and Germany, writing on the philosophy of law, and he's held in especially high regard for his attempts to deal with the difficult subject of international law. In connection with this, he's considered by some to be the first important fellow to argue that it's up to the individual to judge the moral rightness of his country's wars and to refuse to fight in ones deemed unjust. In other words, he argued that loyalty to king and country had to yield to a higher law of international justice. Good as this might sound on paper, however, it's a legal principle on which it's not easy to act. It's especially hard to understand the significance of information bearing on international issues. And to act against one's friends or one's country can also put one in danger of violating what we call higher laws. This is the old church in Delft, although it's not really older by any appreciable amount of time than the new church. Vermeer is buried here, and so is the scientist Anton von Leeuwenhoek, considered the inventor of the microscope, who was also the city official who dealt with the disposition of Vermeer's estate when his wife filed for bankruptcy after his death. <laughs> 
1654, the arsenal blew up and destroyed or damaged much of the city, especially south of the Mark. But Delft still probably has as much of the atmosphere of 17th century Holland about it as any city its size. It had a population of about 25,000 in Vermeer's day and has about three times that many people today, but there are still a lot of neighborhoods where there are no real streets and like so many towns in the Low Countries, it's full of canals which add a lot of charm. Here's a nice looking 17th century building. Although, as I said, Vermeer's wife had to file for bankruptcy after he died, she was from a relatively wealthy family which owned a brick factory, and brick was, of course, the favorite building material for houses like this. In this picture, you're looking north from the new church on the Mark into the little street called the Ademannstieg, and Vermeer's father owned a combination house, tavern, and art gallery about a block north of the square on this street probably on the, the west side, but there's nothing left of the actual building. In this picture, you can also see a couple of stores selling something for which Delft is probably even more famous than it is for Vermeer, Delftware. When the ships of the Dutch East India Company began bringing back boatloads of Chinese porcelain in the 17th century, it proved very popular in Europe, and the potters of Delft quickly began imitating it so well that no one could tell Delftware from the Chinese originals. In fact, by 1700, it was being exported back to the Far East. The store on the right is an outlet of the De Porcelain Flace Factory, established in 1654, but like most such places, it went out of business for some time in the late 18th century in the face of competition from mass-produced wares. It was re-established in 1876. The new building at the back is the Vermeer Center. It's where the Guild of St. Luke, the Painter's Guild to which Vermeer belonged, once stood. It has reproductions of all his paintings. Vermeer was born in the Flying Fox Inn, owned by his parents, which stood where number 25 Voldersgracht is now, not far from the Guild House. The picture usually called the Little Street is always considered to be one of his earliest, but whether it represents an actual location or is just an imaginary setting is still argued about. In 1654, the city was virtually destroyed by a giant gunpowder explosion, more about this later, which would seem to mean that this would have been painted before that if it is a real plain air picture. It is, however, often dated after 1654, which would mean it's unlikely to be a picture of an existing cityscape. He was born in 1632 and married at 21 in 1653, the year in which he was also enrolled in the Painters Guild. When the painter Carol Fabritius was killed in the explosion the next year, Vermeer was mentioned in connection with him in a memorial poem, so it's thought he might have been his pupil. And another older artist, Leonard Bramer, was a witness at his wedding, but we really know nothing about how he learned to paint. Since Vermeer's father was, as an art dealer, a member of the Painters Guild, it's likely Vermeer himself was around painters his whole life. The bottom line, of course, is that genius isn't subject to deconstruction anyway. The ability to paint like Rembrandt or Vermeer isn't something you can be taught any more than you can be taught to grow six inches. This is another picture which is among Vermeer's earliest, according to the standard authorities anyway. It's called the Procurus, and it's widely thought that the laughing fellow at the left might be Vermeer himself, but this is just a measure of how desperate people are to try and make a tangible human being out of him. The best evidence for this being Vermeer seems to be that the fellow who is also supposed to be Vermeer in the painting called The Artist, presumably Vermeer, in his studio, which we'll see later, is wearing what looks like the same outfit. But for this to be relevant evidence, we have to suppose him to have still owned the same clothes for 20 years. I don't personally find that so strange, but I'm still not convinced that this is Vermeer. <laughs> 
He was baptized a Protestant, but his wife's family was Catholic, and he apparently converted after they were married. But if that's Vermeer in the picture, he didn't spend all his time in church. This picture, which got a lot of attention at the 1995 Washington National Gallery Vermeer show, is now also considered by many to be one of his earliest works. The subject is St. Praxedes, Santa Prasede, who is shown cleaning the beheaded body of a martyr and wringing the blood into a vase. Certainly not the kind of subject which one usually associates with Vermeer, but it is known that he painted some religious subjects early in his career which may well have been done for Catholic clients. The usual claim is that his earlier pictures like this one, if you accept the attribution, tend to have warmer colors in them, reds and browns, while the mature pictures are typically dominated by cooler colors like blue and yellow. This is owned by the Johnson & Johnson Band-Aid and Bandage people, which seems appropriate, I guess. <laughs> This picture called The Soldier and the Girl in Berlin is more what we think of now as a typical Vermeer. Vermeer was certainly not the first genre painter. H.W. Jansen gives that honor to Peter Bruegel, although there are precedents that go back to at least the early 15th century. But in any case, what we usually think of as genre painting or ordinary life painting or slice of life painting did not really come into its own until the Dutch turned to these subjects in the 17th century. The same is true for things like landscape and still life, which were entirely unknown to the Italian Renaissance and are rare even in the North before the 17th century. Only about 35 pictures are attributed to Vermeer, and most of them are, apparently are set like this one in a room in the tavern art gallery where he spent most of his career. Given what is always called the calm and serene or even magical or mystical atmosphere of his pictures, it is a little hard to believe he actually painted them in a room in a bar where rowdy people were downing their Budweiser's just a few steps away. Several props show up in his pictures over and over again, like the white vase and the chairs with lion's heads on them uh, in this picture. Here in the Frick collection is another picture called A Soldier and a Girl, but Vermeer didn't put names on his pictures. This could very well be the same corner in the same room in his house, with just some of the little details changed. David Hockney has gotten a lot of press lately for arguing that optical devices and various sorts of mechanical contrivances were used by artists to help them paint. But this is hardly a new theory, hardly some secret to the history of Western art known only to initiates and now made clear to us for the first time by Hockney. In the case of Vermeer, it has long been supposed that he used a camera obscura or camera lucida to help him. The more sophisticated camera lucida works essentially like a camera without film. It will project an image of the 3D world onto a 2D surface so that an artist can use it to at least outline his subject. But the light must be bright for it to work, and of course the image vanishes when the sun goes down. Various inventors going back to Alberti and Leonardo as early as the 15th century are sometimes given credit for it, but it was apparently known in antiquity. Here's the girl up closer now. It's sometimes argued that the way Vermeer paints light, especially on shiny objects like the glass the girl is holding or the lion's head in the chair, gives away the fact that he used a camera lucida. Things like the way the figures are positioned and their proportions are also pointed to, but I'm not sure what this all means. Things much more sophisticated than the camera obscura are available to artists today and there's a whole school of painters, the photorealists, who imitate the effect of the camera, but no one would mistake any of their work for something by Vermeer. And on the other hand, no one would mistake a Vermeer for a photograph. John Ruskin hated the work of Canaletto, who used a camera lucida to produce his almost photograph-like cityscapes in the 18th century, 
He called them miserable, heartless, virtuous mechanism because he thought the use of the camera lucida was cheating. And he probably would have thought the same of Vermeer if he thought he too had used the thing. But art isn't a game with rules. All it counts is the result. This is the woman with the red hat, now in the Washington National Gallery. Both the woman we just saw and this subject have a certain slightly out of focus look that might indicate Vermeer's use of the camera lucida, but this certainly does not look like a photograph, and it is not to the advantage of the camera lucida theory that, as I said, none of Vermeer's other paintings would be mistaken for photographs either. Here's another Vermeer, this time in the Herzog Anton Ulrich Museum in Braunschweig. In most of Vermeer's pictures, nothing dramatic is happening. This is about as much action as you see in any of them, and it's tempting to imagine what might be going on. The fellow bowing over the lady's hand must be saying something like, Do you come here often? What's your sign? Something like that. The girl has a sort of grotesque grin on her face, which is very unlike the subtle expressions given to most of the subjects in his pictures. This is the woman with the picture in the New York Metropolitan Museum. Vermeer was well regarded in Delft during his career. He was head of the Painters Guild for some time and was called upon on one occasion to help settle a squabble over the worth of some paintings, a squabble which involved the son of Rembrandt's friend, Van Eulenburg. Nevertheless, he was not to be generally recognized for what is now taken to be his true greatness until after 1900. And this picture was bought by the New York financier Henry Marcond in 1887 for $800. Of all artists now thought great, Vermeer's reputation is probably appreciated the most since it's nadir. And prosaic art historians are now driven to be poets in the attempt to explain their fascination with him. His work is said to be becalmed by a magic spell, according to one. He is said to be the master of purposeless beauty and of the poetry of everyday life. He is said to have captured the soul of silence. And it must have taken something like a magic spell to put this much calm into a picture painted in a bar, and it's worth mentioning that he also had 11 children. What spell did he use to keep them out of his hair? His wife is thought to have been the model for some of his women, but no children are ever seen. Oscar Wilde says that the most beautiful things are the most useless. He's thinking of things like peacocks and lilies. He also says that all great art is useless, which isn't true. A lot of it was certainly at least meant to have a purpose beyond being a beautiful thing to put on the wall. Almost all Italian Renaissance art was meant to make you a better Christian or to remind you of some historical event or person. The work of painters like Roystal and Vermeer is more like music in its effect, and that's an effect that's very difficult to put into words. Almost all of this picture is painted in shades of blue and yellow, and it's often argued, as I mentioned earlier, that this is the typical color combination for Vermeer's mature pictures. It's been suggested, in fact, that there's a kind of metaphysical significance to the use of these colors. Blue and yellow are, of course, the colors of the sky and the sun. Water, air, and light are associated with them. And when you mix blue and yellow, you get green, the color of life. Just as when you mix water, air, and light, more or less, you get life itself. Here's one of the most often reproduced Vermeers, the milkmaid in the Rijksmuseum. Somewhere Van Gogh says that the visceral response that the yellow sun and the blue sky of Provence produced in him reminded him of uh, Vermeer, the effect of Vermeer's pictures. <laughs> 
This picture caught Joshua Reynolds' eye, too, all the way back in the late 18th century, but even high praise from him wasn't enough to raise Vermeer to general estimation. I imagine the spiritual quality of yellow and blue were behind the choice of those colors to represent the University of California. Maybe not, but they do seem a lot better than some combinations, which are clearly of no metaphysical value whatever. Red and white come to mind, for example. The Girl with a Turban is another very well-known Vermeer. This was bought by the Moritzois in 1882 for a hundred dollars. The last Vermeer to be publicly auctioned in 1955 sold for $350,000, which doesn't seem like a high price today, but several Rembrandts were sold in the 1950s for less. There are only two or three Vermeers in private hands now, so your chances of getting one are pretty slim, even if you're Bill Gates. This girl was called the Mona Lisa of Holland by the French critic Etienne Torre, who went by the pseudonym William Berger, and who is usually given credit for doing as much as just about anyone to bring Vermeer to the attention of the public. But Marcel Proust was perhaps his first real celebrity advocate since Joshua Reynolds. In All Our Recherche du Temps Perdu, Swan is trying to write an essay on Vermeer, which significantly is never finished, and the poet Bergat in Proust's book dies while he's looking at the view of Delft we'll see in a few minutes. The woman writing here is now in the Irish National Gallery in Dublin. She was, in the late 20th century, stolen twice from the estate of the Irish nobleman Alfred Byte, but recovered both times. A lot of Vermeer's pictures do, like this one, depict people reading. I should really say depict women reading, because women are, by and large, his favorite subjects. Only three or four of his pictures are, are centered on men. They depict women then reading or writing letters, and often with musical instruments. I mentioned earlier that Vermeer's pictures create something like the effect of music, and Walter Potter says, in fact, that all great art aims at the condition of music. That might be hard to defend, but this great art certainly seems in part to aim at that. Last time we heard some of the music of Jan Peterson Svelink, and a piece also by his pupil Heinrich Scheidemann, but important as Swalink is in the history of Dutch music, neither he nor anyone else in that history comes close to equaling the significance of painters like Rembrandt, Halls, Royce Dahl, and Vermeer. This is another example of a letter reader in the Rijksmuseum. We did hear a piece last time also by the North German organist Dietrich Buxtehude, who was much admired by Bach and who far right outranks any Dutch composer of the 17th century, and we're going to hear a piece now by another fellow marginally connected to Bach, Johann Pachelbel, who is the great one-hit wonder of the age. It's hard to call him a great composer, but his canon in D is probably the most familiar piece of 17th century music on record. He was born in Nuremberg and died there as the organist at the Sebalduskirche, which we saw last quarter, but before taking up that post, he worked in several other cities, including a one-year stint in Eisenach before Bach was born. Then he had Bach's brother, Johann Christoph, as a pupil in Erfurt. This is the picture called the Love Letter in the Rijksmuseum. But there's also a lute in it, and we're going to see some more of Vermeer's pictures now, starting with ones that have musical instruments in them, while we hear a version of the famous Pachelbel Canon. It was apparently originally written for three violins and continuo, but the arrangement we'll hear is the one made popular by Jean-Francois Payard, who made one of the first recordings of the piece uh, back in the 50s, I think, for the Musical Heritage Society. It has since been arranged for just about every conceivable instrument and combination of instruments. There's even a version conducted by Harold Farberman that's arranged for kettle drums. It's probable that you've heard the canon in one of its various incarnations, but if you 
haven't, you're sure to like it. Everybody does. <music> Here's a guitar player who seems to be wearing the same jacket as the woman in the previous picture. Here's the picture up closer. There's no musical instrument here, but there's the same jacket again. This picture was in the Helen Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston until it was stolen about 1990. It's never been recovered. This is called the interrupted conversation. A girl at a virginal in the London National Gallery. And another keyboardist in the same museum. This lady is playing the harpsichord in the Queen's Collection at Buckingham Palace now. Here she is up closer. And here's someone for whom all the serenity's been too much now. And the lace maker by Vermeer in the Louvre. This was a favorite of the Renoir. The only real landscape Vermeer ever painted is the view of Delft you see now in the Mertzois. But there are those who consider it the finest landscape ever painted. I mentioned last time that some people think that Roystal was the first painter to do landscapes on location. But some people give that honor to this picture. That is, they say it is the first to have been painted on location. Vermeer and Roystal were essentially contemporaries. This was the picture by Vermeer that first impressed Torrey Berger, and as I said, the writer Bergat in Proust's Sala Recherche du Temps Perdu dies after looking at it. Kenneth Clark says that of all paintings, it's the one most like a photograph because of the treatment of light, but it really doesn't look like a photograph at all, certainly not compared with things produced by modern photorealists. <laughs> The usual date given for it is 1658, but I don't know why. Vermeer would have been just 26 then, but remember Rembrandt was only 26 when he painted the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tulp too. The powder explosion which destroyed all this part of town took place in 1654, four years before this, so I guess it could have all been cleaned up by 1658, but Simon Shama suggests that this might just be an ideal view of the city, which was in fact still a mess at the time it was painted. In the distance, the tower of the new church is visible, and on the far right is the Rotterdam Gate, 
The powder arsenal was where the building with the little cupola is to the left of center. Vermeer at least imagined his view of the city from this vantage point. This is a modern photograph of the city from that point, and there are some interesting similarities, even if the color and lighting are very different. There's a boat, more or less, in the foreground of each picture, and another boat seen prow on to the right in each picture. Vermeer's actual viewpoint was, however, apparently farther up the bank behind which the point at which this photograph was taken and on which there were no buildings in his day, but now that point's inaccessible. This is a closer view of Vermeer's picture. The part of it that is spatially overwhelmed for God is apparently the yellow roof to the right of center, which he calls a patch of yellow wall. Van Gogh also wrote to his brother Theo that this picture is incredible when you see it close up. In 1670, Vermeer moved from the north side of the marked square to number 25 out of Langendijk on the south side. Although it's not a museum or anything like the houses of Rembrandt or Rubens today, it has been much changed in 350 years, but parts of it, especially in the kitchen, apparently are 17th century. Some think Vermeer's house was actually where the chapel is now, to the left of the house I've indicated. And this is where Vermeer lived the last five years of his life until his death at just 43. It's not a very big house, certainly, but the painting known as the portrait of the artist in his studio was likely painted there though some give it an earlier date, and the setting is reminiscent of many of the pictures he apparently painted when he was living on the Ottomanstieg. This was bought by a Viennese aristocrat from a saddle maker in 1813 for the equivalent of a few dollars. It was taken from the Vienna Art History Museum on Hitler's orders and hidden in a salt mine where it was found at the end of the war, and it's now back in the museum. The girl apparently represents fame or Cleo, the muse of history, who holds a book in which great deeds are to be written and a trumpet to, as it were, trumpet them abroad. So is Vermeer, in effect, glorifying himself in the picture? Or Dutch art? Or Holland, a map of which hangs on the wall? Here's Cleo, or whoever, up closer. It's interesting that Vermeer depicts himself painting her and not the picture itself, which we see, but I'm not sure what significance to attribute to that. Here's Vermeer himself with his back to us, which just further adds to the mystery of his personality and his art. Torrey Berger, who first attributed this to Vermeer back in 1865, refers to him as the Sphinx of Delft, and that seems to fit. At his death from unknown causes in 1675, he still owned 29 pictures, including the view of Delft we saw a minute ago. This supports the view that he painted most of his pictures on spec without having commissions for them, as was more and more the practice among Dutch artists. The pictures were apparently turned over by his wife to cover a 500 guilder debt to a grocer. That was a very large debt, but 11 children will eat a lot of groceries. In 1696, 21 paintings listed as Vermeer's were sold as part of an auction, and they brought an average of 70 guilders each. A good price. The fellows in Rembrandt's Night Watch paid about that much each to be included in that masterpiece, and Rembrandt's most expensive etching cost 100 guilders. The gold in one guilder is worth about $50 today. After the 1696 auction, his entire corpus, as I mentioned earlier, pretty much dropped out of sight for more than a century. There's an interesting postscript to the history of Vermeer's work, though. In the 1930s, a modestly successful Dutch artist named Han van Megeren created his own would-be Vermeer using techniques that he thought would satisfy all the artistic and scientific scrutiny of the day,
And when Abraham Bradius, considered the dean of Dutch connoisseurs, enthusiastically attributed it to Vermeer himself, the Boymans Museum in Rotterdam, assuming Bradius to be right, bought it for $286,000, a fabulous amount for 1937. I'm going to give you a chance to test your own eye now. This might be the picture by Van Megren, or it might be a picture by Vermeer himself. Don't be misled by the religious subject here, the Christ in the house of Mary and Martha, because remember Vermeer is thought to have painted some religious pictures early in his career, like the St. Praxedes we saw. And now we're going to see another picture, which is also by one or the other, Vermeer or Van Megren. The subject here is the Supper at Emmaus. Now, which do you think is the real Vermeer? Okay, time's up. This is the forgery. This is the Van Megren. But if you guessed wrong, don't feel bad, because almost everyone was fooled in 1937. Van Megren went on to forge several more pictures by Vermeer and other artists, which he passed off as paintings from a relative's estate, but he was finally caught in an interesting way. During World War II, he sold some of these pictures to Hermann Goering, and then after the war, he was accused of selling national treasures to the enemy. He then had to either admit they weren't national treasures and go to jail as a forger, or stick to his story and go to jail as a Nazi collaborator. He decided to admit that he forged the Vermeers, but then, irony of ironies, no one would believe him. He had to paint one in court by way of proving he could do it. But even then, the jury might have been uncertain until it was discovered that he had used pigment which had been adulterated by the man who sold it to him with chemicals not available to Vermeer. He was sentenced to a year in prison for fraud, but he died of a heart attack before doing any time. It's common now to have art critics express amazement that connoisseurs could have ever thought Van Megeren's fakes like this one were real Vermeers, but Monday morning quarterbacking is real easy. A lot of museums still have works of art on display, which may well one day go the way of the Supper at Emmaus. It's hardly possible to imagine a greater contrast than that between the poetic and serene world of Vermeer's subjects on one hand and the brutality of the Thirty Years' War, which was at its height about the time he was born, on the other. We've heard a little in passing about this war, which the Dutch consider to be part of what they call the Eighty Years' War for Independence from Spain, which began in 1568 with the execution of Egmont and Horn by Alva. I mentioned earlier this quarter that when Charles V abdicated and left his son Philip II with Spain in the Low Countries, the Spanish Netherlands at the time, the stage was set for this war, and I also mentioned that Charles left his brother Ferdinand I with the empire proper, i.e. the Habsburg possessions in Central Europe. And this is Ferdinand, or his armor anyway. This could pass for a photograph of him taken in 1560 or so. He's overshadowed in history books by his brother Charles, but he signed the Peace of Augsburg with the Protestant princes in 1555, by which the famous principal Cuius Regio Eus Religio, whose realm his religion was put into effect, the idea was that at least all the electors could choose between Catholicism and Lutheranism, and their subjects would either, would either have to go along or move out. There were lots of other provisions, and there were many loopholes, but both sides were really anxious for peace, I think, at almost any price, and for 50 years there was no major religious conflict in the empire. Ferdinand's son, Maximilian II, and again this could be a photo of him, came about as close as any Habsburg ever did to becoming a Protestant emperor. He allowed William the Silent and many other Protestants to take refuge in Germany. He put pressure on his cousin Philip II of Spain to be more willing to compromise in the Spanish Netherlands. He was virtually the only Catholic ruler to protest the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in Paris, and he refused the sacraments on his deathbed. This is armor that belonged to Maximilian's son, Rudolf II, who is one of the more bizarre characters to head the Habsburg family. 
He was interested in just about everything but government and turned most of the management of that over to self-indulgent favorites, usually condemned by historians, while he studied, experimented, and above all collected everything from Durer's Madonna of the Rose Garlands, which he had carried upright by hand all the way from Venice to Prague, to unicorn horns, ostrich eggs, coconuts, and anything thought to be of magical significance. Here's an anonymous portrait of him. He supported the astronomical researches of Giordano Bruno, Tycho Brahe, and Kepler, who dedicated his Rudolphine tables to him, but more because they were astrologers than because they were scientists. His favorite painter was Giuseppe Archimboldo, certainly one of the more original artists in European history. This is his picture called The Fish Man. Rudolf is usually considered to have been on the borderline of sanity in his later years, and his taste for this sort of thing might seem to be consistent with that. He never married and had no children, which meant that the heir apparent was his brother Matthias. Rudolf issued the so-called Letter of Majesty in 1609, granting freedom of worship to Protestants in Bohemia, on paper anyway, but since Matthias was known to be an ardent Catholic, the Bohemian Protestants were worried about what would happen when he got to the throne. And this is now an anonymous portrait of Matthias, who took over in 1612 on Rudolf's death and moved to Vienna, in part to get away from the religious troubles of Bohemia. Like Rudolf, he was childless, so the question of who his successor would be was also on everyone's mind because he was already in his 50s and not healthy and not expected to live more than a few years. The electors who were Catholic favored his cousin Ferdinand, the Archduke of Styria. Matthias and his right-hand man, Melchior Claesel, the Archbishop of Vienna, were accused of ignoring the letter of majesty, and it was clear that Ferdinand planned to ignore it as well. <laughs> Prague now with Ragini Castle or Palace and the Cathedral of St. Vitus across the Moldau. Prague has not contributed a lot that gets into most art history texts, but if you're interested in 18th century architecture, it has as much per square block as any city in Europe, and especially since the collapse of East European communism, it has become one of the great tourist destinations on the continent. Much of the palace as it stands now was built in Maria Theresa's day, but a good deal of the late medieval section survives just this side of the cathedral in this photograph. In 1618, a group of Protestants, angry about the attitude of the representatives of Matthias in Bohemia, stormed into the governor's hall in the wing of the palace that projects to the south, and threw two of them and their secretary out of the second floor windows. those windows from the inside now. The fellows were not seriously hurt, according to the Catholic view, because they were protected by divine intervention, according to the Protestant view, because they landed on a pile of garbage. In any case, it is usually said that this is the event, known as the defenestration of Prague, with which the Thirty Years' War began, and we'll hear more about it after the break. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 